to TEDx York School 2019. I am so honored that you all here are here to support the courage that our students are about to exhibit by sharing their stories with you. A uh, little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, I would like you all to, to take out your devices and put it into airplane mode. It helps with our microphones and everything. Um, no, not all of you. Those of you who are watching the live stream, do not put your devices in airplane mode. That will stop the video. Um, but for all of you, thank you for doing that. Um, I have been doing this here at York for over five years, and it has been one of the honors of my career. Um, but I haven't been doing it alone. Uh, one person I've been working with every year since we started this um, is Grace Q. She started out as a student of mine, and uh, she is now about to graduate from, uh, from college at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And uh, I want to welcome her to the stage, who's our production manager. Hello. Um, so I just wanted to keep this short and sweet. I wanted to give a thank you to all of our sponsors. So that's Scudder Roofing and Solar, as well as Ian Martin Photography. <laughs> Lovely over here, capturing our memories. And then Knowing Technologies as well. Um, they helped make this all come together. And then also I would like to give a huge thank you to the York School Advancement Office, as well as any York School staff and the student production team who are really making this night come together. And then finally, oh, wow, uh, the, for the students and the guests and um, all of our speakers who have really just put a lot of time and dedication into preparing their ideas and talks for you tonight. Um, I've met with them one-on-one -on -one while I was at school, just on video call and watching them have everything go from like one point to how it is where you're going to see it tonight um, was just truly a heartwarming experience, I guess. Um, it's really rewarding for them. It has been for me too. So I hope you guys enjoy your evening. And with that, uh, here's a short video from Ted to kind of just show you what this night is all about. It starts with an idea, and sometimes that idea is small. Sometimes that idea is so small that you don't even notice it. But at some point, the idea becomes an action, and that action causes a splash, which then produces ripples. The theme for this year's TEDx York School is the ripple effect. Think about how those small actions have broad effects that we can't possibly anticipate. Those are the ripples that shake up our world, and it all starts with an idea. Our first idea comes from Jia Cheng Lu, a person who can express himself in six different languages. You can count on him to go running, take on extra classes, solve any printing issues, and lastly, remain lively and enthusiastic during it all. He is truly a superman. Please welcome Jia Cheng to the stage. So allow me to introduce you to my own sleepometer, which I use to determine if I've earned the privilege to sleep at night or not. Well, I start asking myself, is the, work, is the work done? Answer is yes, I'll go to sleep. If the answer is no, I'll then ask myself, well, is it late? If the night is still young, I'll go do it. But if it's already pretty late, I'll go do it anyway. <laughs> Hybrid. Life goes beyond work, and unexpected circumstances do happen. What if it's already 3 in the morning, and I still struggle to call it the day? I'll go do it. Anyway, I love keeping myself busy, and it's easily met by my multifaceted interest. So starting at my, ju at my junior year, I decided that it was time to stop messing around. I wanted to live a quality and meaningful junior year. So already being one of the two 
only two in my grade who qualify for both AP Calc BC and AP Physics C in my grade. I signed up for six classes in total, three additional AP exams that I had to study independently, all kinds of extracurricular activities that I don't even have the time to mention, cross country, and the role of student technology assistant. So I uninstalled my video games and cut my sleeping time in response to my increased workload. And for a while, I think I had everything going well. And I believe that all it would take is more determination and more self-control to drive myself forward. Well, little did I know how unstable my schedule was. A quarter into the semester, the printers at my school deteriorated into a constant stage of malfunction. I and my buddies spent hours and hours, weekends, holidays, trying to ameliorate the mayhem caused by the unresponsive printers. Seriously, look at that face after fixing printers for 10 hours in a row. If that is not a sincere smile, I don't know what is. Every day, all kinds of people ask us to fix their printers, and it didn't seem to stop. And I know some of you inside this audience have asked us to do the same thing. Again, this increased time investment required me to re uh, reorganize my schedule. But this time, I had no more slot in my schedule to spare. What ended up being sacrificed was academics, and once again, sleeping time. But I thought it was a simple process of once again, improvise, adapt, and overcome. Well, I was out of luck. Charged with the fatigue from the lack of sleep and the frustration from the unsuccessful interactions with printers, I appeared to school every day, sullen and hostile. One day I woke up, and I felt like everyone around me has done me something wrong. Meanwhile, I had more and more homework to do, and yet I started to procrastinate. The video games that I uninstalled earlier have somehow managed to be reinstalled on my phone, <laughs> and they suck up hours and hours of my life. <sighs> One day, after I turning a horrible piece of history paper, I realized, like, well, this schedule is unsustainable. Here is one bad history paper, and more are on the way. I showed up to cross country like a zombie, and I raged over random issues, and that consumed a large chunk of my life. I needed to make a change. When I, the tech officer, yell at students for unsuccessful attempts of setting up the printers, no one is being helped. The only result is that both people being very unhappy. If I feel like everyone around me has done me wrong, the truth is the world owes me absolutely nothing. I am the only one that has done myself wrong. I overcommitted myself. I overestimated, overestimated myself that I could achieve everything. And individual heroisms like this has proven pernicious before to me. My thoughts went back to last summer when I, alone studying in Spain, decided to celebrate my 17th birthday with an impromptu mountain climb. When I was only a few hundred feet away from the top, I accidentally spilled my water bottle and lost all of my water. The summit was right there. I could see it. And another 20 minutes would do it. But I made a decision of backing down which couldn't have been better. Because after the almost fatal midsummer Spain sunshine made me finish this 1,000 feet descent by half walking, half sliding on my butt, <laughs> I couldn't walk. I poured half a gallon of water down my throat before I ended this catastrophic mountain climbing by calling an Uber back home. And I feel so bad for the Uber driver because I made a mess in, her car, in his car with all of the dust on my body. I probably would not have the chance of speaking to you right here had I not given up the mountain climb. Because on my, there wasn't even an inch of my skin unscratched on my leg. So drawing my attention back from these dangerous experiences, I decided to take a leave from my tech officer position. It's great to be out of one's comfort zone, but challenging oneself has nothing to do with panicking. We do not learn that way. Or do we really? After I resumed my position, 
I learned one extra phrase. If I see an extraordinarily difficult tech challenge, I start to say, no, we don't support that. <laughs> it's not a sign of disqualification, and I actually receive more support among the student body after I pick up that phrase. <laughs> I often say yes to things timorously and reluctantly. Well, reluctant because I don't really want to do it, but yet timid because I think if I say no, I'll let the people down. I assume that since I'm the person being asked, I'm one of the very few that can accomplish this task. So then I say yes, overriding all of my judgments and just let the work piling up until my brain sends the sign of overwork by just uncontrollable procrastination, such as playing games for three hours in a row. And with that, even more work is piling up, and I send myself into this vicious cycle. The only solution to that is to refuse this demand that I cannot take in the first hand. I find it also helpful to realize that if my body turns into dust in the next second, the earth keeps spinning. I know you guys would just be looking disappointed because the speaker just disappeared, but other people would just find someone else to fulfill their demands. I'm not an absolute need for everyone. Neither are their requests what keep me alive. This thought suppresses the individual heroism that has convinced me that I could achieve everything. If I cannot achieve everything, I have to focus on the most important element of my life. I cannot uh, sacrifice my bigger picture for other side-tracking tasks such as staying up until 4 a.m. investigating how to track down irresponsible printer users while laying aside my chemistry, AP chemistry homework. I have to focus on the most important aspects of my life, such as health, academics, while refusing some of the other tasks. As Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs puts it, focus is about saying no. People say, the word no is the most powerful word in the English language. And I, as a polyglot, I want to take this a step further. The word no and its equivalents in any other language are some of the most powerful wor words of this world. Thank you. Next is someone who's more of a learn-it-all than a know-it-all. If you were to have a warning label, it would say, warning, be prepared to smile. Jackson Cherry, everyone. I want to get as rich as possible but not so I can buy myself more stuff, so I can give all my money away. Let's back up a little bit. A few years ago, I was your average enlistee in the Navy with a life full of problems. I was constantly trying to patch up by buying a new gadget or some new clothes, and I wasn't getting very far. Now, the only thing worse than being stuck in behavior like this is not realizing you're stuck in behavior like this. A small spike in serotonin you get from buying a new thing gets you by just long enough that you don't realize your life isn't actually any better. As soon as it wears off, you've forgotten all about your original problem and can only focus on the problem at hand, which can unfortunately be resolved with more retail therapy. Now, to take my normal problems at the time to a new level, almost four years ago, I broke my neck in a car accident so left me paralyzed from the collarbones down. And I dealt with this new set of difficulties with exactly the same mindset. For a while, my life was drastically worse, and I spent drastically more money trying to fix it with whatever I could buy on the internet. <laughs> I bet you could guess I still wasn't getting very far. 
My life did start to change, though, and that's because I fell in love with this amazing human being, Lizzie. We couldn't stay away from each other, and we were both incredibly happy. And things change so fluidly in life that it's difficult to pin down exactly what's going on if you aren't necessarily trying to. I know that I was happy, and I knew that Lizzie was responsible, but I still didn't know that owning more stuff wasn't going to make my life any better. Early last year, we took a trip to Thailand, and I had a spark of interest in Buddhism after seeing it completely ingrained in the culture there. Near the end of our trip, Lizzie was diagnosed with what we would later learn to be a very aggressive form of cancer caused by a rare genetic mutation. So as soon as we got home, she was admitted for treatment at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, which is about 90 minutes from where I live today. And being unable to be by her side every step of the way was a pain unlike any I'd felt before. So I decided to buy some books on Buddhism and explore mindfulness and meditation as a way to get through my emotional struggles. And I began going through a transformation that really changed my life. Just six months after her initial hospitalization, Lizzie passed away. And as much as I miss her, and as sad as I was, I didn't fall apart like I thought I was going to. Instead, I came to somewhat of a realization. I realized there is no amount of consumer therapy that can fix anyone's life. And in the end, it all comes down to human connection. On top of that, I also needed a purpose. So in memory of Lizzie, I devoted my life to mindful entrepreneurship and philanthropy. It is an absolute fact that beyond meeting our basic needs for food, comfort, shelter, water, and a sense of security, there's no amount of money that can make anyone happy. And that brings us to the cycle. Most of us here, we go to work, make money. We learn about a problem we didn't know we had. Luckily, we can buy the solution to that problem. Eventually, we get bored of our purchase, realize that we're sad again, and also have no money. So we go back to the beginning and start all over again. This is the life that we are all sold from day one, and no one truly realizes the damage it does. Our problems aren't actually getting solved. They're just getting pushed to the back of our brains so we can enjoy our new whatever. And eventually, they can pile up and damage our mental health in a similar way to addiction. Financially, those of us who can afford to keep buying things year after year could be doing so much more with our excess money. And those of us who can't afford to keep buying things year after year, well, we can end up building a mountain of debt. Environmentally, the more stuff we buy, the more stuff is produced and eventually thrown away, which is not only depleting the limited resources we have on this planet, but littering it with what we once considered to be the solution to our problems. And I bet if the planet falls apart, none of us are going to be happy. Essentially, the way we act and use money and consumerism is unhealthy on all fronts. So I got to thinking, why doesn't everyone just live at a relative level of comfort, set themselves up to do the same in retirement, and use the rest of what they make to help others? You would no longer need to worry about what to buy next, or how to impress the neighbor you don't like. And it's almost guaranteed that you would build countless meaningful human connections that will in turn bring you lasting happiness, a sense of purpose, and a feeling of fulfillment that you're doing good things with your life. Philanthropy doesn't need to be a title reserved for the elite 1%. And if we all focused a little more on helping each other rather than what to buy next with our Christmas bonus, I'm certain the world will become a better place, beginning with your own happiness. It's precisely this thinking that started me on my journey of entrepreneurship solely for philanthropy. And my goal is to use social media outlets like YouTube and Instagram to make philanthropy accessible to everyone, as well as documenting my entire process so you can follow along, learn as I learn, and find your own way to change the world. 
So I'm asking you to consider if there's more you could be doing to help others. We don't all have the same wants, but we do all have the same needs. So maybe you could start by helping someone else meet theirs. Now, I'm not asking you to donate all your belongings to charity and live like a monk for your remaining years, but simply take a mindful approach to how you spend what you make and how it affects the rest of the planet. Thank you. This next speaker is someone who's genuinely caring, thoughtful, and kind. So much that she wouldn't even hurt a fly. And trust me, I've been in many situations with this particular girl where I've seen her physically hold people back from killing an insect. This person is also endlessly talented, and you're about to see how. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Danica Tang. Let me see by a show of hands. How many of you bought something online this week? That's a lot of us here. Think about how you made that purchase. You open your phone or your laptop, and with a few clicks, you can have it delivered straight to your door. But today, I want to take you to the other side of that journey, uh, that, that purchase screen, and introduce you to my online shop. I am the owner of the shop Danny Cat Treasures. This is what it looks like. I sell a selection of jewelry that I make and design myself, as well as other miscellaneous items. Most of what I sell, for comes, most of the inspiration for what I sell comes from things that I want to have, but don't want to spend so much money on as a broke high schooler saving money for college. That's why in my shop, you can find ukulele hangers and even fake nose rings for under $10. And my shop has been pretty successful. Within the past year and a half of opening, I sold over 200 of my handmade items and made around 2,000. Let's go back in time a little to two years ago when the idea of having an online shop never crossed my mind. I was cleaning up after art class and I saw a piece of wire lying there on the table. I didn't want to throw it in the trash, so I picked it up, brought it home, and searched on YouTube about what I could do with that piece of wire. And I made it into these, my first wire ring and my first wire wrap pendants. Although they weren't perfect, I was surely proud of them. And I continued to make more, using stuff that I had around the house, like nail polish for the little pink flower you see in the center, in a keychain that I took from another keychain for the little pendant. And eventually, I was able to make stuff like this. Of course, I had to have a teacher, right? Well, my perfect world-class teacher was no other than the internet. I learned through online craft communities, Pinterest, Instagram, anything I could find. And through those platforms, I was able to make a lot of friends too. And I even did a few craft trades where I would send them a few of my crafts and they would send me theirs. Like these little cute guys here. As I got more and more involved in those communities, people started asking me about buying those items. And some people even encouraged me to start an online shop. So I decided to try it out and began preparing for everything. But I was scared. What if I advertised the idea of having an online shop in front of my friends and family, and I fail at it? What will people think of me? Weeks and weeks went by, and I still wasn't prepared. But one day, I was so tired of the preparation that I accidentally clicked the button and opened the shop. Well, I couldn't go back after that now. So the good news is 
About a week later, my first customer placed an order. I was ecstatic, and I ran to my mom telling her the good news. But after that, I felt very lost. What was I supposed to do now? I don't know how to run an online shop. And I had to just work with what I had. So instead of bubble wrap, I used tissue paper. And instead of actual jewelry boxes, I made them out of origami paper. And in the first few months of opening, I received a lot of feedback. Some words of encouragement, others complaints. One of them was like this. Hello there, I received the cat ring today, and it's adorable, but I was concerned because there's an obvious portion of the wire that is silver, while the entire rest was in gold. I wasn't sure if that was due to wear already, which is a little disheartening. When I first saw these messages, I was like, oh no, they're going to leave a bad review, and that will be the end of my shop and my entire career. But that wasn't the case. People were very understanding of my mistakes. That same customer that messaged me about the wire on her ring actually became a returning customer, and she encouraged me a lot through my learning process. People say that the internet is a scary place, but so many people are out there who are really kind as well. I soon learned that most people only leave five-star reviews or no review at all simply because they want to encourage the sellers. In addition to the feedback that I got, I also learned many rewarding stories through conversations with my customers. For example, a girl said that she gets compliments on her rose ring all the time and wanted to order a customized ring with her favorite color on it, which is light blue. She later on thanked me, saying that she is actually disabled and spends a lot of the time in the hospital. And having her favorite color on her ring makes her very happy. Other customers have thanked me for making a unique birthday gift or graduation gift for their loved ones. When schoolwork gets heavy and I have 10 orders to make at the end of the week, knowing that I have the chance to make someone happy with each order makes me very happy as well. Now you might be wondering, what if I'm not interested in this online shop chaos and the arts and crafts stuff? Well, my point really is this. If you're interested in something, start somewhere, explore, and everything will fall into place. With the same mindset of exploration, I've discovered many more of my hobbies. I learn how to use different craft mediums. I've sought I've self-taught myself the ukulele, the kalimba, harmonica, and recently, I've been trying to pick up the alto sax in band. <laughs> I've even gotten into planting, like my mom and my grandma, because I saw a plant on sale in the grocery store. A small moment in art class took me to starting an online shop, and many other small moments took me to discover so much more. You never know where your idea can take you. And a shameless self-promo. If you ever need to temporarily solve your problems with a bunch of shopping, you can always visit my shop at dannycattreasures.com. Now a special performance by Kevin. But what most people don't know is that his real name is Omid in Farsi, which translates to hope in English. Just like how he hopes for his music to make people happy, or how he hopes for his loved ones to be healthy. So give it up for Omid Deliri, because hope is in the house. <laughs> It was June 18th, 2016, when I got my first laptop. To get a better feel for the computer, I decided to go through the different applications. Safari, Google, settings. <laughs> <laughs> I went through them all, till I landed on GarageBand. 
Now, growing up, I'd always been interested in garage band because I had always listened to artists, but questioned what the music making process was actually like. So eagerly, I opened it up and began to make a couple beats with the different plugins that they offered. Before I knew it, the whole day was gone. It had completely captivated me. Now, the rest of my summer went something like this. Wake up, make a beat, write lyrics to that beat, record the song, do it again. Continuing on with music, I created a profound love for the process. I started out with a built-in computer microphone, and I managed to get to a $20 microphone off of Amazon, which I paid off from working a couple hours around the house. And then I went to a $300 microphone, which I got from selling some of my clothes. <laughs> and then finally, I went from the free garage band to the not-so-free Logic Pro X, which did cost $250, but I got it for free. Ultimately, I ended up paying the price of like 134 viruses when I figured out. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Two years later, here I am today. But I'm not here to talk about my musical background with you. I'm here to talk about the discovery that music led me to find. Now, two months ago, I was in my room, reflecting on music and the impact it had made on my life. I questioned, why don't I feel the same passionate way I do with music about everything else in my life? I then thought of a different example, me wanting to learn how to skateboard. Now, I had always told myself that I wanted to learn how to skateboard, but I just never had the opportunity, until one day. One day, my mom came home with a penny board, which looks like this. It didn't look like a skateboard, so at first I was thrown off, but I was still equally excited. When I realized that it was too small to ride, when my mom asked me, are you going to learn how to skateboard, I told her, I would, but it's just too small. It's not my size, so I can't write it. I continued on making these excuses with the skateboard and continued on living with my life, never writing the skateboard. By comparing these two contrasting examples, I realized something. I realized that the only reason that I still suck at skateboarding and I'm still doing music to this day, is because of my initial response to problems. With skateboarding, as soon as I recognized an obstacle, I used it as a way out. But with music, even with my lack of resources, I went as far as to illegally download a software. I've recently realized that Tuning into my initial response is key. Whenever I find myself in situations where I'm using an obstacle as a way out of something, I take a step back and reevaluate that thing's importance to me and how much it actually means. By tuning into our initial response to things, it has kept me from wasting my time doing things that I never really wanted to do and has instead allowed me to apply that time into the things that I actually wanted to do. By focusing on our initial response to problems, it reveals to us the true passions and feelings we have about certain things. If you were given an opportunity and you used an obstacle as a way to get out of it, then you shouldn't be taking that opportunity in the first place. If you were truly passionate about something, you would just, well, do it. With the power to recognize our initial response, we can start saving time, energy, and begin focusing on the things in life 
that we actually want to do. Thank you. So I have a little time left. You guys want to hear a song? Check, 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 check. Yeah. I feel like I don't know you, baby. I'm sitting here with no clue, crazy. Whenever I go hold you, baby. You're still the one I'm close to, baby. Cause I get to love you all over again. Rather have you than have closure instead. The fact that I, I do not know you just means I just want to bring you closer to me. Chilling on a Friday, chilling doing my way. Baby, can I see you? Dripping on the highway, thinking of the nice ways I can go to treat you. Always on my mind, cause I always need you. Lucky is a find I can never leave you. I feel like I don't know you, baby. I'm sitting here with no clue, crazy. Whenever I go hold you, baby. You're still the one I'm close to, baby. Cause I get to love you all over again. Rather have you than a closure instead. I think that I do not know you just means I just want to bring you closer to me. Thank you. Up next is someone whose name matches his bright and bubbly spirit. If you were ever to be stuck on an island, I'd bet my money on that he'd have a deck of cards in his pocket. Be prepared to be wowed and inspired by the amazing Sun Shooty. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is a bit embarrassing, but uh, I've got some magic in my pants. Uh, now, I apologize if I've misled you, but as a magician, that's pretty much my job. I spend my time learning the art of deception in hopes that if I'm successful, I can deceive you into believing reality is a certain way that it simply isn't. If done correctly, I, the magician, will have set up all the variables of the magic trick, only letting you think you've made a decision that eventually culminates in an impossible ending. Let me give you an example. If I asked you to pick a card, any card, but I only offered you this one, well, you wouldn't feel very free in your choice of picking the three of hearts, would you? But if I had an entire deck and asked you again to take any card you like, well, you'd be much more free, wouldn't you? Well, maybe, but not if you're dealing with a magician. So that is, in essence, what I do. Oh, oops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, us magicians give the impression that you've been in control when, in reality, you're simply following the little breadcrumbs already laid out. Now, many of you don't seem surprised by this explanation, and neither should you. It's no secret that's what we do. But there is another connection you should be able to make, because you do this very same thing to yourselves every single day, which is why I'm up here. I'd like to make the case that we are not free of will and that our future is written in permanent marker on the poster board of the universe. Now, we all experience this thing called free will. 
In 2015, according to the Scientific American, around 4,500 people were polled and asked if they had free will. And the overwhelming majority, 59%, answered yes. Now, when I say free will, the more specific version I'm referring to is called libertarian free will. Now, put simply, libertarian free will is the ability to have done otherwise. It is to say that had you the ability to wind back time, you could have done something other than what you did. That is libertarian free will. And this idea seems rather intuitive. I mean, I can do whatever I want, right? I'm in control of what I want, right? Well, we humans are pretty easily manipulated. Just last year in 2018, $151 billion was spent on advertising products to American consumers. If this didn't work, why would these tycoons keep on spending these absurd amounts of money? And because of this fallibility, not only can we fall to the trickery of others, but also to the sophistry of our own minds. And however widely accepted this notion of free will may be, it's actually somewhat contested. Allow me to try and persuade you. If we start with the assumption that free will exists, then it must manifest itself within our actions. I mean, that's exactly what free will is. It's the ability to do what you want. Now, there are only two reasons we do anything. One, we're forced to, or two, we desire to. Now, obviously, if someone forces you against your will to, let's say, spend your Thursday evening watching a bunch of teenagers talk about themselves, Many of you will know all too well that that can't possibly be an exercise of your free will. But let's talk about the will we all feel we have, the will to do what we want. Let me ask you a question. Do you control your desires? If you like your coffee without ice, why is that? If you don't like country music, did you choose that? And even if you went out of your way to get your coffee with ice despite not liking it, or listen to Maria Carey's collective works on a car ride home just to prove you're free, <laughs> try to dig into that thought process and see where you can find your freedom. You'll end up running headlong into a desire to prove you're free, another desire you did not author. Now, if our freedom's not in the only two places it could be, well, where the hell is it? <laughs> Allow me to do one more trick for you. Now, I could use anyone for this trick, but uh, why don't you stand up for me? And uh, could you tell everyone your name? Why don't everybody give uh, Josefina a round of applause as she joins me on stage? <laughs> Just right up here. Thank you for being a part of this. Uh, now, in a moment, I'm going to show some pictures up on the slide here. And oh, just before I begin, um, I wish I could say we've never met before, but that would be a blatant lie as well we go to school together. Uh, but I can assure you we've planned nothing in advance. Now, in a second, like I said, I'm going to be showing a few items up on the slide here. You're going to pick any one of them in your mind, and uh, you're going to go ahead and write it nice and large on this piece of paper here, all right? And just uh, do not let me or anyone else see what you've written, and tell me when you're ready. I can tell by the way she's writing down. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Great. That's all right. I can take the marker. Wonderful. Now, there's no way I could have predicted which of these items you chose, right? <sighs> Last night, <laughs> I took a good chunk of my time to uh, write out all of this. <laughs> uh, here's where we started. I've got some magic in my pants. Oh, and there's where I dropped the card box. And uh, here's me talking right now. Now, of course, this is all memorized. But what if it's not? What if it's a transcript of things not only in, but also out of my control? Well, Safina, you still have that thing in your mind, right? Let me ask you something. Do you feel free? <laughs> <laughs>
Good, I'm doing something right. Uh, well, if we go ahead and turn this around, right here it'll say, oh, better hope this works. Josefina will choose the flamingo. Now, Josefina, will you go ahead and show everyone what you've written? Flamingo. <laughs> everyone give Josefina a round of applause if she has a seat. Thank you so much. Now, we feel free. We really do. Each day, we make all sorts of decisions, and our mind and our environments dazzles us with the wonderful magic trick of free will. But we are not the authors of our minds or our environments. I believe our past, present, and future are written in permanent marker on the poster board of the universe. The best magic tricks feel real. And even if you don't believe in free will like myself, it's too important to the functioning of our minds and our societies to believe otherwise. I hope that I've convinced you that what it is like to not be free, yet constantly under the impression you are, is what it is like to experience a magic trick. Thank you for all coming to my TED Talk, though I know you could not have done otherwise. <laughs> Now here's someone you can easily fall into an hour-long conversation with. He may be one of the younger teachers here at York, but his wisdom and but he exudes wisdom and insight beyond his years. Allow me to introduce you to Mr. Colby. His first name's Elijah. One afternoon when I was a boy. I was sitting in my dad's truck with him outside Indian Head Bank in Keene, New Hampshire, where I grew up. He was trying to balance his checkbook, I think. And to keep me occupied, he gave me a riddle. He said, imagine an arrow in flight and freeze it midway. In that moment, it's neither moving to that spot nor from that spot. It's motionless. And if the same is true for each instant along its path, the question becomes, how can the arrow actually be moving? How is it not just a string of frozen moments? Now, years later, I realized he had fed me one of Zeno's paradoxes of motion, which are debated like 2,500 years after Zeno's death. I think I was nine. <laughs> but I mention it because I want to talk about moments in time. If that moment is this week, then that's this year. And that's my life in dots, one per week. I'll give you a little bit of scale quickly. This is when I was in school. This is that moment outside the bank with my dad. This is a very lucky week when I met my wife. And these are the weeks I had with my dad, my first 31 years. I want to talk about uh, not only moments in time, but, uh, but my dad, too. He didn't wear a watch, incidentally, and that pretty much describes his relationship with time. He, uh, he wasn't one to rush through a conversation. He never hurried off the phone. He always had time for you, sometimes more time than you had time for. Uh, this made him a natural teacher, and that was lucky for us because he had at his fingertips a remarkable range of practical knowledge to pass along. He taught us to ski and skate and shoot and sail. And, and he schooled us in this methodical, analytical approach he had to most problems, which allowed him to fix virtually any mechanical device. Uh, it's true that some years we didn't get Christmas presents until like the next summer. And we had this mini bike that sat in the corner of the living room, partially assembled until long after I was mini. When we, when we moved into this little house in Alstead, New Hampshire, here in 91, uh, it was a place where the doors didn't shut because the building had settled. And though my dad was a carpenter by trade, instead of just planing the doors to fit the new frame shape, he decided to place bottle jacks at strategic locations under the house 
And so as not to break anything by rushing, he started cranking them at a rate of about one revolution a month. <laughs> the house had been settling for probably 60 years, and he seemed happy to spend another 60 years fixing it. This was home improvement on like a geologic time scale. <laughs> Meanwhile, the place had no doors, and if you weren't careful, peeing was a spectator sport. <laughs> James Hilton uh, in Lost Horizons describes Shangri-La as a place where you have so much time that you enjoy sunsets as men in the outer world hear the chimes of a clock. And maybe this is the stubborn adoration of a son for his father, but I choose to believe that my dad wasn't just a wicked procrastinator. I like to believe that he was operating on a different clock than I was, my hummingbird wings to his elephant heart. But his liberty from time had more serious consequences too. When I was much littler, we lived in another old house out in the boonies, and despite having time, tools, and opportunity, I'd never really finished it, so it remained drafty and without central heat through some pretty wicked cold winters. Uh, I had seven older siblings, and even we were outnumbered by mice in the kitchen who were so comfortable <laughs> that you'd flick on the light, they would like huddle and plan their escape routes high five before they took off. <laughs> uh, but his inability or refusal to follow through roiled his own father and was probably one of the reasons that drove my folks to divorce. Rather than linger on those minutes, I want to zoom forward to this one in 1998. My dad is driving me back to boarding high school. It's November, which means cold before you're ready and dark too early. I start thinking about the mountain of work I have to complete for classes the next day and about the fact that those grades are going to be seen by colleges, determining not only where I go, but my job when I graduate and my station in life, the value of my time on earth. This pressure of this future is, is um, rushing toward me. Some of the young folks in the crowd might be able to relate. So when we stop for sandwiches and my dad asked me what I want to drink, something cracks in me. And, and actually through tears, I say, it doesn't matter. I think, who cares? My dad didn't give me a lot of direct fatherly advice, but that next moment stands out. He looks at me and says, hey, dude, of course it matters. Zoom forward 12 years, I'm eating dinner at my desk in an investment bank in central London. I wear nice suits. I fly first class. I think I'm ahead of the clock. I'm the youngest VP in the firm. Big cheese. But my time is not my own. The hours are long. The client dinners are mandatory. I have a colleague who jokes that after these long weeks, he walks into his own kitchen and his kids burst into tears because they think there's a burglar in the house. <laughs> like many around us, his, his bank account is healthier than his, than his body. But the phone rings and it's my brother offering me a bib to the Boston Marathon in three weeks. I agree immediately, cut out of the office early, and run east along the Thames River past noisy pubs and lighted office towers out through the quiet streets of Greenwich. And when I can't run anymore, I take a cab home, exhausted but happy. And in that moment, something of the veneer of that lifestyle has cracked again, and I've started making plans. Just three years later, but no longer being an investment banker, I have three weeks to spend with my dad opening up the family summer property in Maine. That sounds fancy, I know, but we're more Clampets than Kennedys, actually. <laughs> it's just fixing a lot of rusted old stuff every spring. But Rain's got us pinned inside, so we're working on his old motorcycle. Now, this is a bike. I remember him plunking me on the gas tank when I was little between his arms. As a teen, it was the bike that I learned to ride on, but it's been sitting for a decade and needs rebuilding. So in the mornings over coffee, we're leafing through the manual and talking. In the evenings, we're kind of admiring our, our work and talking. After three or four days, we drop in a fresh battery, inflate the tires, roll it out of the barn. He insists that I be the one to start it. And there's a moment when I crank it over, and it sputters and spits and coughs, and then it starts. 
my dad was a loving man, but he wasn't one to gush. And hugs between us past the age of about 12 were kind of a shoulder to shoulder affair. But when that bike starts, I don't have time to react before he leans across it and gives me a hug. Full, lingering, frontal, breaking all the man hug rules. <laughs> and then because my weight on the seat has shorted out the battery, he steps back and says, hey, your crotch is on fire. <laughs> we, we, we managed. But later that same week, actually, the summers started, weather's beautiful, house is full of family, and it's buzzing with dinner prep. It's cocktail hour. The last of the boaters are coming up from the water, and my dad takes a seat on a couch where he would have been able to survey the whole scene. And there's a moment where he takes a labored breath, and then his heart stops beating. A moment later, I'm giving him chest compressions, my brother at my elbow reminding me to slow down. But he's already gone. He's early for the first time in his life. At 66, he's finally rid himself of the only metronome he's ever carried. That brings us back to now, this moment with you all. I married my dream girl. We have this perfect daughter. I have time to read great books with my English classes and run every mile with the cross-country team I coach. By any measure, I am a very lucky man. Now, maybe Zeno's paradoxes solve a little calculus, or maybe the premise is false. I don't know. But what is a life if not a string of a million moments? What I do know, I think, is that when I think of my dad, each of those moments exists, persists. And as he might say, each one matters. This is every day of my daughter's life so far, 50 weeks. Now, her moments stream out in front of her, and all my dad's moments are in the past. They have none in common. I don't want to be my dad. I want her to have heat, first of all. <laughs> but when I manage to slow down, to unhook from time, to really be with her, it sure feels like I've bridged the gap between these two great loves of mine. So each morning I make her breakfast, and each night before bedtime, I read her books, and then I scoop her up, and we slow dance around the living room. I've started telling her stories of her grandfather. That motorcycle's sitting in the barn in Maine again, and when she's ready, I'm going to plunk around the gas tank between my arms. Someday, maybe, she'll help me bring it back to life. Thank you. I asked our next speaker what his spirit animal is, and he said it's a coyote, which is totally accurate. I mean, coyotes are smart, vocal, they like to run. The only thing that separates the two is that this person is vegan. Jared Griffith, everybody. Hey, Jared. You're anorexic. What? No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. Look at you. You're a little twig. No, I'll prove you wrong. And I certainly did. Having gained 20 pounds of a bully's words. My mom was right. The summer before, wait, sorry. <laughs> One of my favorite things to do in kindergarten was to go down the slides, play hide and seek and tag. 
One of my classmates enjoyed similar activities, and every day after school, we would play game, these games together. Over the course of the year, uh, we became buddies, and unfortunately, he transferred the next year, and I was left alone. This was around the same time that the words of my classmates began haunting me. Desperate for a friend, when I heard that he would be transferring back for the second grade, I was ecstatic. The first day of school came and passed. Um, the first day of school came, and uh, the whole school met at the usual place for an assembly. I searched for my old friend and noticed that he was standing with a group of people who was sent hit my way. I walked up and I said, hey, do you remember me? Yeah, I do. You're that kid who everyone keeps talking about. Get out of my face, stupid. I walked away feeling worthless. My parents and my sister, my only friends. The summer before fifth grade, I transferred to a new school. The school was relatively small in size, and it was an opportunity to make my first friends. The fir I, was, I was exhilarated at this chance. The first day of school came and passed, but I didn't connect with anyone. I was alone again. I remember one day in which I came home crying because it felt like no one wanted to be around me. My mother came in and she hugged me, and I told her, Mom, it feels like no one wants to be my friend. I feel so lonely. I don't want to go to school anymore. Jared, everything happens for a reason, and you may not know that reason yet, but you will eventually. And when you do, it will all make sense. You have a very kind heart. Keep your head up and stay strong. You cannot control how others act. The only thing that you can control is how you deal with it. Don't let the words get to you. And surprisingly enough, my mother was right. <laughs> I know, that's kind of weird hearing from a teenager. Uh, Everything does happen for a reason. Whatever situation you're going through right now in your life, there's a reason for it. Every person who comes into your life is there to teach us something. So I'm not saying that bullying is a good thing, because my experiences as a child were both lonely and painful. But I do believe that they taught me a great deal about myself and how to treat others. One of my purposes in life, I believe, is to make others laugh and smile. And I put myself in uncomfortable situations to do this because I don't want anyone to feel the same way I did during those years of my life. I was called anorexic, and uh, I gained 20 pounds because of it. I was bullied, and I learned how to be kind because of it. If I could turn back the clock and prevent those experiences, would I? No. Why? Because those experiences made me into the person who I am today. Isn't this similar to your lives? Without your experiences, would you be the same person that you are today? I assume not. There are so many things that I could say were, but this story is not meant to be about the past. This story was about me, but now it's about you. You have the power to change the world, to stop bullying. You have the power to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation and stop hate, even if you're the only person who's willing to do so. You have the power to be kind to others. Oh, and don't forget, your mother is always right. <laughs> Last but not least, we have York's queen of the iconic look, fuzzy socks and sandals. In a perfect world, this person would be a cartwheeling mermaid who plays water polo professionally. And if she had to, she would choose tacos for life over sushi. Please give a warm welcome to Zibi Lindholm. <laughs> now, before we get started, I want all of you to do something for me. Close your eyes. Imagine that you are standing on a stage. Blinding lights hiding the faces of your audience. Thousands of people poised and ready to judge your every move. 
do you feel confident? Are you having regrets about getting up this morning? Now you can open your eyes. I have always been told that I'm confident. When I was just seven years old, I hated the math computer program my school used to teach times tables. So, laboriously, I went to the principal and I explained its many flaws. <laughs> now, later that year, he removed that program from the curriculum forever. When I look back on that situation, I ask myself, what happened there? Some people assume that confidence is an innate quality that requires no thought. And frankly, so did I. For example, when I first applied for TEDx, I was confident about my admittedly bold topic. And when I first wrote up my speech, I thought, I have it in the bag. But when I submitted that first draft to my fellow speakers as if it were my final speech, I was displaying the dark side of confidence, the side that had led me to believe that my talk was superb, perfect even, without revisions. Wow. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> every single person in that room urged me to rethink almost everything about my talk. I didn't feel too confident then. In fact, I couldn't even imagine getting on this stage feeling that way. I was broken, classic rain slide. <laughs> I knew these people meant well, but I couldn't, I could barely hold back the weight of the tears fighting to run down my face. I felt like I had nothing left but a strong sense of regret. Why have I done this to myself? I wish I had quit earlier. What a pain. I shouldn't have even applied to talk this year. But when I got up the next morning, I had a thought. Confidence is not an innate quality. It requires thinking. In fact, come to think of it, I've been thinking about confidence a lot. <laughs> Pre-thinking does not signify a lack of confidence. Sometimes, even before the simplest of conversations, I sit contemplating and rehearsing responses, questions, comments that could apply to the situation I'm going into. I spend hours premeditating each dialogue and engineering each interaction, hoping that at some point I end up in a real conversation. Then I thought about the thinking. What am I doing with all of this contemplation? I am taking myself out of the stressful situation. I am pre-living each moment and using my imagination in an environment of my own creation, a safe place. This is the way to prepare for whatever real life ordeals may be on the way. To, to quote 2019 MacArthur genius author Linda Berry, we don't create a fantasy world to escape reality. We create it to be able to stay. However, this escape method often comes with a mountain of overthinking. Did I really just say that? Should I have mentioned? I call this a brain virus, and left alone, a virus can cause other problems, too. For example, as soon as I start consciously thinking about breathing, all of a sudden it becomes the single most complicated thing I've ever done, leading to a near-death moment of self-asphyxiation. <laughs> Now, let's take a step back. Examine the process. Confidence is a thread that weaves its way through everything that we do. From the simple act of walking out the front door to speaking your mind in front of an audience, it supports us. Let's follow that thread. In my story, we saw it first in the sloppy beginnings of my first draft. Then it appeared again in my recovery, sewing its way into the edits of my third draft, all the while hemming the edges of my thinking and embroidering the fringes of my imagination. Well, the point is, we can see it. But what about your story? Do you think you can see it? 
It was there when you got up this morning. It was there when you walked out the door. It was there every step of the way, carrying you forward through time. Confidence gives you the option to choose what you project to the world. Without confidence, people can be forced to change parts of themselves. With it, you can express yourself as the person you want to be. Now, I mentioned my third draft. By this time, it was last Sunday, and it still wasn't done yet. Panic had set in. I thought I had lost the thread, but I hadn't. I needed to move on from thinking and start doing. Confidence is not an innate quality. Thinking can only do so much. Work needs to be done. So that's what I did. I started writing, rewriting, hating it, rewriting again. But despite all of that, I stand here before you giving the part of the speech I had struggled to write. When I felt I had lost my confidence, my mind became hostile. I had thrown away even the confidence needed to create that safe place. But then I started thinking, imagining not only moments ahead, but the past, which I've already survived. Now, for the people, who are out, there, for the people out there who, like me, sometimes stumble on words and sometimes struggle to get up in the morning, Confidence cannot simply be solved with a superhero pose or a, mere, a smile in the mirror. It takes work, time, and effort to build up that courage. But it is always possible. Now, I want you to close your eyes and do it for real this time. <laughs> Imagine you are back on that stage. Same blinding lights, same people watching. But this time, think. Imagine each moment of flawless success. Now, as you give your long-anticipated speech, talk, dance, body language, interpretive dance, whatever you want to do, breathe. You've done it. Do you feel confident? You got up this morning. You walked out the door. Now you can open your eyes. See the thread, no matter how faint. Because, after all, if I can do this, well, I'll let you do the thinking. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you are as inspired as I am. For those of you who don't spend every day here at York, you should know that, well, this is the kind of experience we have ev all the time. Now that you've got a feeling of the ideas that get generated when we come together, we hope that you take these ideas and help propel this ripple effect and keep them alive. Have a great night. Mm -hmm.